Well, hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski, and I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us today for our weekly virtual seminar at the Center. It really is a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is one of the leading scholars in the space. Claudia Meliado is professor at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso in Chile. Diego Gomez Sara, doctoral candidate in the program of technology and social behavior at Northwestern and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Claudia in just a minute. But before I do that, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building partnerships and relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, historical recognitions, partnerships, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me briefly uh, say how the seminar will now unfold. First, Diego will introduce more properly Claudia's research and career in just a few seconds. Then Claudia will deliver her seminar. And after that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Diego and I will moderate. And at the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Diego, the screen is all yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Professor, for the introduction. And thank you, Professor Millado, with because you are here with us. Thank you so much. It's For me, it's a great proud to have more Chilean researchers here in the center. So I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Claudia Millado as today's Centers for Latinx Digital Media Speaker. She is currently a professor at the School of Journalism at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso in Chile. Uh, Professor Millado is a doctor in communication from Universidad Pontificia Salamanca in Spain. And after her doctoral studies, she became a postdoc in journalism at the School of Journalism at Indiana University. Her research areas are journalism cultures, comparative studies, journalistic role performance, and journalists and social media. Professor Millado's work has been cited more than 1300 times and part of her most cited articles include Mapping Journalism Cultures Across Nations, a comparative study of 18 countries, What Shapes the News Around the World, How Journalists in 18 Countries Perceive Influence of Their Work, and another article is Professional Roles in News Content, Six Dimensions of Journalistic Role Performance. Her last two edited books are Journalistic Role Performance, Concepts, Context, and Methods, published in 2017, and Beyond Journalistic Norms, Role Perform, and News in Comparative Perspective, published this year. Professor Mediato is also an associate editor of Communication and Society Journal, a member of the editorial board of the Jour Journalism and Mass Communication Quarterly Journal. She also has been associate editor of Communication Theory and guest editor of the special issue, New Paradigms and Approaches to Journalism and Mass Communication Research. Journalism Mass Communication Quarterly. She has received in several communication journals, uh, she, excuse me, she has reviewed in several communication journals, such as Journal of Communication, the Mass Communication Society, and the International Journal of Press and Politics. Professor Miyato has received multiple awards and honors during her academic career. She received the Presidential Fellowship in Chile for her doctoral studies. She also uh, has received several times top faculty awards at AGMC and ICA conferences. 
And Professor Miguel recently was awarded with the first top paper in the Latino Latin American Research um, Division and the second top faculty award at the ICD Stevenson competition at the AGMC San Francisco conference that happened this year. Last but not least, she has more than 26,000 followers on Instagram, acting as a journalist and a lifestyle influencer. Please join me in welcoming Professor Claudia Miguel. Thank you very much. First of all, I mean, thank you all of you for, for having me today in the seminar. Uh, this, is, this is such a great initiative. Um, I know Paolo for so many years now that I, I actually, I couldn't say no to such a lovely invitation to, to share with you some of my research. I would also like to thank Diego, which is another Chilean, as he said, for such a nice introduction that uh, I don't really feel that I even deserve. <laughs> so today I would like to talk to you about the topic that fascinates me, which is journalistic performance and identity construction, and this time in relation to digital media spaces. So I'm gonna share my screen. Just are you seeing my presentation now? Yes, we can see it. Cool, wonderful. So uh, journalism as a profession, as you know, was always studied under the umbrella of the news media with journalists embedded within organizational and social structures. Over the past few decades, the conceptual boundaries of journalism has been reimagined due to the new digital environment. In traditional media, news professionals are expected to follow the norms and practices created and perpetuated in the field as a way of maintaining autonomy and authority and to differentiate it from others. By contrast, social media spaces lay outside these institutional boundaries serving as public, uh, semi-public, and private spaces for connection, interaction, and amplification for the part of individual journalists. Social media platforms, as you know, were not conceived to be used only by journalists. They existed before journalists arrived. As such, journalists have negotiated working with norms and expected behaviors unique to the logic and, let's say, this rule of the game of these new media spaces. So the results on getting into social media has been a constant effort of balancing norms and practices from the traditional professional side with those of social media platforms. So starting from there, it's possible to deduce that professional norms are not necessarily the same across all media logics and do not translate into the same role performances. This, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that the roles that journalists perform in offline media cannot be present in social media spaces, but it implies that journalists are developing new ways to perform their identities as professional and persona. I mean, uh, in traditional media, journalists report on a story. In social media, instead, they can be part of the story, becoming a topic themselves. So given that social media are cases that transverse and to some extent collapse the boundaries of the professional and the personal, as well as the public and the private. In this presentation, I am interested in analyzing journalists' ongoing struggle to maintain the status of the profession and at the same time develop their individual reputation and cultural capital through the use of digital media platforms. So taking children journalism as an example, I will discuss different conceptual models of role performance in social media spaces, examining how journalists engage with, contest, and even diverge from different norms and practice of traditional journalists. And specifically today, I would like to exemplify on three roles that we have seen as persistently present in the performance of journalists in social media the promoter, the celebrity, and the joke. While these roles are not new and have been largely analyzed in other fields such as promotional culture, celebrity studies, marketing, and humor research, what is interesting here is uh, for me to analyze how the performance of these roles directly connect 
with the merging of the personal and the professional and the public and private forces of journalists in action, as well as how the blurring of the editorial and commercial decisions at the individual level of the journalists may impact the nature of the profession as a whole. As you know, people engage in front stage and backstage performances of the self in any given situation, and not only journalists, just all of us. And today it is possible to argue that the rigid front stage and public presentation of the self associated more with the traditional media is transformed into a more complex and layered embodiment on social media. In these spaces, journalists curate the content that they share, developing their strategic position and credentials by displaying both the front stage and backstage performances to their post. In other words, and different to what happened in social in traditional media, I'm sorry, the public can view both types of performances by the journalists simultaneously. Moreover, in traditional journalism, journalistic performance is defined as the collective outcome of specific newsroom decisions. In social media, the institutional platform is not the same, right? Since journalists are able to open accounts and post on them as if those accounts were their own media outlets. These differences between these two levels of analysis, the news organization on the one side and the individual journalists in, on the other side, are methodological, theoretical, and also epistemological. At the methodological level, the subject of analysis is not the news outlet anymore, but the individual journalist account on social media. At the theoretical level, media studies must concede space to world theory and identity research in order to develop fresh concepts that help to explain the new public-private sphere in digital media. And finally, at the epistemological level, we need to move from objectivism to more space of constructivism, where people build their own meaning in multiple ways, assuming the evolving nature of human existence, let's say. So compared to the institutional spaces of news, uh, news publishers, the boundaries between the public and the private and the professional and the personal are far more blurred in social media. And clearly people might maintain fluid dynamic selves mediated by the contextual space in which they operate or their, their specific positions and the role they perform. You know, while this has been actually always the case, uh, the prevalence of the idea of multiple selves has increased as a great deal since uh, digital media and digital platform has become legitimate spaces for communication. So for journalists, uh, the self-expression can take the form of sharing their professional work and of branding themselves as a way of self-commodification that seeks to increase their market value. I mean, we can clearly observe that the personal and the professional are not exclusive positions on social media they actually exist as co-identities that shape both sides of the, their persona in the post they share with the audience. In legacy media, the journalist work mostly depends on endogenous and institutionalized forces such as their news media organizations. In social media, by contrast, journalists can also be influenced directly by other external forces. Individuals can decide whether or not to follow journalists and like or comment on their post. Similarly, advertisers can bypass the publisher and look to the journalist as a social media influencer who will promote, endorse, or advertise products or services. As you know, such endorsements have become a common way to link a brand with an individual profile, image, and reputation on social media. In that process, digital journalism itself has converged with a promotional culture with journalists transforming themselves in different characters, gaining authority and credibility as cultural intermediaries, agents between the audience and products or services. This cultural capital can also be converted into economic capital, much as actors, athletes, or other public figures have done in the past in traditional media, but this time advertising by performing specific practices on social media. 
during the, the past few years, my colleague Alfred Armida and I have been working on a project about Chilean journalists and social media performances, developing some of the work I will show you today and that you can see on the slide as well, some of our publication. And other Latin American colleagues, such as Amarant Alfaro, who is in the audience today, I, I think so, and Auska Obando have also get involved in this endeavor, working very close to me in order to understand how journalists negotiate their identities and professional roles on Twitter and Instagram. So to do that, we have relied on a mixed model sign, conducting a large content analysis of social media profiles and also of social media posts from Chilean journalists. At the same time, we have conducted an important number of in-depth interviews with journalists and also digital ethnography. So based on a theoretical development and all this empirical work I, I just mentioned, uh, our study seeks to expand existing analysis of journalistic performance identifying key factors in the construction and deconstruction of journalist identity on social media. Specifically, it looks for an examination of the interactions between the personal and the professional and of the journalist along with the publisher and products I mentioned on the other, representing endogenous and exogenous forces in digital space. As you can see on the slides, we, we analyzed first a spectrum of performance by journalists from narrowly professional action to much more personal actions on social media. On the one hand, journalists may take a conscious decision to act in a strictly personal manner, limiting their social media activities to those prescribed by the position in the news organization. The conscious self-promotion is, is here intended to sort of craft a persona of a credible and trustworthy media professional reputation. On the other hand, journalists may also use unconscious self-expression from a personal perspective to provide details on how they are as people and sharing their experience of everyday life. Secondly, we analyze the forces that influence journalists' performance on social media, acknowledging that journalists operate within the endogenous forces of the organizational structure of media publishers, as well as exogenous forces that account for the rise of the influencer economy on digital platforms. So to show this model in action, we may consider four scenarios, at least, which illustrate the reconstruction of journalism in digital spaces for the case of Chilean journalists. All the examples I will show you today are from Chilean journalists from different type of national media platforms, including anchors, news presenters, reporters, and freelancers. They cover different beats, have varied levels of experience, and play a, a range of roles in their uniforms. They also have different levels of activity and popularity on their social media accounts. We have studied more than 800 journalist profiles, more than 10,000 10, posts from 100 specific accounts that we are actually finding finishing to code and interview 31 of those journalists. But, you know, I, I thought that while you can find those figures uh, in a journal article, it was more interesting today to illustrate through some specific examples of all of which we have found. So, take the common scenario where a journalist shares a post that is professional in nature, and it relates to their own media organization. The, the content may promote their individual journalistic work on that or of their colleagues as well. For example, the journalist may publish a photo of their work in the newsroom and comment on a link on a piece that they produce for their media organization. And at the center of this slide, we can see such a situation. It can also involve a repost or a retweet of a piece produced by, I don't know, their, for example, here TV channel such as what, what Monica Rincon does um, that you can see at the lower side of this presentation or a column that a journalist writes for a newspaper, such as we can see from Daniel Matimara at the upper right side of the slide. In a second scenario, instead, 
the journalist shift to a more personal identity, but within the professional context of the media publisher. As you can see here, this kind of performance is generally seen as in a you know, manufactured basket. So a journalist may share photos or videos of themselves before they go on the air, seemingly offering sort of a, a peek of behind the curtain of television or radio production. Look, for example, uh, what Scarlett Cardenas from Radio Vio Vio is doing here, or Catalina Edwards from Radio Infinita in Santiago, or David Branovich from Televisión Nacional. In another case, they may also share videos of themselves working in their newsrooms or preparing the stage for their reporting, et cetera, et cetera. So here, the professional and the personal blur, right? But still take place under the overarching umbrella of the publisher. In both cases, the professional and the personal are able to operate subject to internal institutional forces coming from the media organization and the related norms and expectations of being a professional journalist. These scenarios fall under the top half of our model and contribute to how journalistic identity has tended to be constructed on social media. However, we suggest that uh, the bottom of our model contribute to the deconstruction of established identities and related role performance, as here, the professional and the personal context of the journalists are under the umbrella of the external commercial forces that we call the product. So let's take the two scenarios where a product rather than the publisher serves to shape journalistic identity. For example, when a journalist interacts with the product in a professional context. In such scenario, the social media content has the, the trapping of the publisher, such as the, the newsroom or the studio. So while, while the journalists uh, take on the role of social media influencer, it's still clearly identified as a media professional, right? I intentionally used the profiles of two news anchors from Chile, Soledad Oneto, a journalist that used to be, have the highest level of credibility in the country, by the way, and Jose uh, Antonio Neme, another important journalist that, and both moves quite a lot on these two spaces. So we can see that they post a photo or different photos of them in the studio, designed to showcase their look of the day, and including a sort of expression of gratitude to the fashion designer or some specific brand that they mentioned. In these cases, the journalist is leveraging association with an organizational media for commercial purposes. In some ways, this can be seen as a reconfiguration of practices in lifestyle, lifestyle media, where uh, free products or travels or accommodations are provided in exchange for a mention in a feature. So the difference is that the commercial relationship may not be as explicitly acknowledged in a social media post. And we will discuss about that later. A fourth and final scenario lies at the intersection of the personal and the product. So in this scenario, details and images of personal activities that occur outside their formal job are presented side by side with services and products. For example, uh, a journalist may share a photo in which she's drinking, like here, um, a herbal potion with the social media post explicitly mentioning the product and praising its rejuvenating property. It could be also a promotional post endorsing a car or any other product or service. In these slides, uh, we can also see how another very well-known journalist, Jose Manuel de Pisanos, used a placement strategy to promote Adidas. So in all these cases, the journalists are explicitly trading on the personal admiration of fans for commercial gain. Nevertheless, posts may be less explicit in their endorsement of a brand, for example, containing details of where they ate for lunch or where they bought their food, for example, et cetera, et cetera. But whether explicit or not, the truth is that such behaviors 
associate the journalist's social and cultural capital with economic capital outside of the institutional structure of the media and clearly push the boundaries of professional norms and standards on journalism. So um, in digital journalists and scholars have already found that branding on social media is inevitable, right? There, there are in dozens uh, of great papers on that topic. But even if, if it's open to various forms of practice, uh, depending if uh, they perform uh, this form of a professional or more personal perspective, uh, we have discussed it during the last few minutes, the results will be different. So in other words, different presentation of the self can be related to different types of promotion of the self. In our operationalization of the promoter role, we propose distinguishing between several indicators. Some of these indicators are linked to the relationship between the journalists and their news media organization, while the others refer to the relationship between the journalists and the product or service through which they do a set of 30 party uh, promotion. So in this post, we can see how Monica Rincon from CNN Chile performs professional branding, advertising their new TV show, Conexión Global on CNN, while the other three posts refer to the promotion that these other journalists do about specific products. Soledad Oneto, again, does, doesn't show the name of the shoe brand here, but she tagged tag it in the text that she wrote. Catalina Edwards and Jose Manuel de Pisanos instead, they explicitly advertised the use of userine and the new FIFA 21 video game. Our analysis have also shown that the celebrity role can be materialized in the performance of journalists on social media through specific indicators as well. There are, for example, some characteristics of reflected pain materialized when journalists report about themselves through retweets or shares or screenshots of material published by others, or when they use element of pain by association. Uh, another indicator of the celebrity role is this trapping of fame, where journalists perform activities that suggest that they are enjoying the lifestyle uh, of the rich and famous. Of course, journalists also need to demonstrate that they are like, just like everyone else and that they do the same things that their followers do. So they can also post about everyday life settings, including images of themselves going to the grocery store or the gym or taking their children to school or waiting in traffic. And finally, and uh, related to this notion of a celebrity is the idea of using a personal branded hashtag based on their name or nickname or another signature characteristic creating a sort of synthetic personalization. So on these examples, uh, we can see several of the indicators of celebrity performance I just mentioned. For instance, uh, Monica Rincon, reposted an interview that a newspaper did to her about coronavirus and how she deal with it. Um, Jose Manuel de Tesanos posts a photo that reflected fame by association, picturing himself with Leonardo Messi and showing us that he knew him since he was not even that famous. We can also see how Soledad remembers how much she enjoyed a very fancy and luxury life when she was one of the presenter of the most important music festival from Latin America, et cetera. But now, uh, and this is something very interesting that I would like to go more in depth, but I, I wouldn't have time, that transversal to these two roles is, is humor and the potential development of a sort of a joke role that journalists can implement at the same time they promote themselves or becoming celebrity stars. And this is, but this is not the only mission of this role. Actually, several journalists perform the Joker role to push the boundaries of humor by engaging in practices such as poking fun at authority figures, offering paradise, or stating the truth, or challenging social norms, all while being seen as dark. 
at the journalistic level, the Joker role tend to be present according to what we have found on social media when journalists use humor while commenting on their work, their colleagues or sources, or present themselves goofing around on the set or in the office. At the more personal level, this role is present when the journalists post these ridiculous videos or images of themselves outside of uh, uh, labor context, or when they you include gaffes or irony in their statements about any aspect of their own life or others. They can try to be funny, make jokes, and seeking to laugh at or win that with themselves or at with others in the post as well. So one of the journalists that mastered the performance of his role in Chile is Jose Manuel de Pesanos, this guy and this guy. If you check uh, his profile, you will see that he includes elements of the Joker role in most of his posts, especially on Instagram, but also on Twitter. For example, we can see him here pretending leaving home without pants, which is of course uh, <laughs> hilarious, or being ironic about the lack of cleaning products during the COVID pandemic and how people have taken all these products in supermarket, supermarket leaving nothing for others. We can also see here all the journalists performing this role, Felipe Delgado, who used to be my student, by the way, he used his Twitter to laugh at the a TV journalist who made a terrible mistake on air when covering a story and many other examples. So um, in conclusion, looking at how these different journalists perform on social media on any random day may reveal different potential and possibly non-mutually exclusive reality. Of course, this is just the very, very beginning of, of our study. There's much scope for research on, on how far media organizations are or are not aware of the range of digital cells presented by their editorial staff. For example, a key question for us is how far uh, these organizations will accept, tolerate, or condemn them, uh, journalists taking on influencer types identities given the decline in traditional sources of revenue and the precarious working conditions and salaries in the industry. In an environment which enables unprivileged uh, ind individual autonomy and self-expression and self-promotion, it, it will actually be illuminating to learn if the media encourages journalists to market themselves and as a, a consequence, their employer as well, in order to get more clicks and traffic. The rise of influencer agencies created by major conglomerates suggests that at least some organizations are willing to do that. So the blurring of, of these barriers between editorial and commercial activities generates clearly an ethical and jurisdictional journalistic dilemma. I mean, whether or not it's possible for the journalists to combine commercial and the professional context without risking journalistic credibility and authenticity and the entire uh, the construction of the profession is a very urgent debate uh, for digital journalism status. Economic pressures may even accelerate trends toward a more freelancer or gig model of, of journalism and may also increase the lure of the journalist influencer model combining professional reputation and providing complementary streams of income. Thank you very much. I just want to mention, because my daughter <laughs> asked me to do that, that she helped me quite a lot on this presentation. So her name is here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, amazing presentation. And uh, it was very interesting for me to see all those pictures. Um, I grew up with many of those journalists when, when I was in Santiago. so. It's very interesting to see how the roles are evolving during um, the last 10 years. So before we start the questions, I really want to encourage the audience that we have all the attendees to ask your questions, use the Q&A option that you have below. 
we will see a bottom Q and A. You can write down your question, and then we can just start asking those questions to the professor. Okay, I want to um, ask you a lot. I also, well, I grew up in Chile. I know these journalists. I'm curious about, um, specifically in terms of how, how social media is extending their control or their their appearance can, in compare, for example, some, some decades ago when journalists, they were still performing some of those roles as celebrities, but probably they were in different spaces. For example, it was marketing. So for example, they could be on television for advertisement or other kind of TV shows, for example, uh, in the morning, like the matinals. Um, and for example, the, um, the marketing purposes. So my question is, what do you think in terms of uh, particularly in this taxonomy, how social media is extending uh, journalists' uh, roles? And is that related to the visual communication that the uh, social media provides? It's just like the um, communication that they have with the audiences. Uh, what is the specific aspect that you think it's key to, to their roles in this space? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, a huge one, <laughs> but uh, I will try to address it. Well, on the one side, I think is there is a, uh, the key is in the relationship between the journalist and the, the publisher. I mean, they, they, at some point they must sincere themselves. You know, uh, um, some publishers know that uh, they just depends on some specifically key journalists who, you know, have this credibility on the audience um, and they even negotiate with them. So journalists uh, basically uh, get more ex internal autonomy if they got this capital power that they need. But you know, they they, they try they, they just are losing more uh, external autonomy, right? Now uh, the relationship with the, auto the the audience is is it's crucial because the audience is providing them a lot of power. So we can see not even on these roles even with more traditional roles that uh, like, let's say interventionism, you know, the voice of the journalist, you can see a clear pattern that all the journalists um, that have this strong uh, cultural and social power uh, in their uh, social media networks and uh, platforms, they are able to, to say almost everything without being affected, you know, uh, in comparison to the others. So um, according to the interview we have um, had with so many of these these people, uh, and they they know how we are what we are doing and they laugh a bit because they are in in journals articles and for them it's, it's quite weird, right? But uh, it's, it's part of the deal. And they they have said that oh, they start in 2010, but actually becomes more pronounced uh, when Instagram was you know a much more solid platform for them. I mean they are not only doing this. I mean we have shown just just a part of it. I mean some journalists actually take a track a more a professional track on Instagram and they use it for that as well. So um, and I think today it could be Instagram, tomorrow maybe it's another and then another. I mean it's not about the specific platform. I will just think that uh, the media logics that these even two platforms that we have seen today, the Twitter and Instagram, are quite different. And uh, the journalists who actually the, the journalist who actually knows how this works, because some of these guys know exactly what they are doing. I mean, they are targeting the audiences, for example. They they know that they are a political animal on Twitter and they, they are super influencers on Instagram, and the audience accept it. So I, I assume that they ask. Why we should just be objective and you know uh, neutral in, in in social media if this is not a property of, of uh, journalism, uh, you know traditional journalism. So I think that that's that's the way that I will discuss this. But it has so many angles. <laughs> right. No, it's 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 hard. Uh, thanks for the great answer. We have one question from the audience, um, and it says. Do you think this approach of mixed roles is something closer to Chilean media because of its size, since it's a small country, few journalists, and seen as celebrities among the audience? 
Oh, yes. Well, that was the question that uh, we got with uh, the study from the very beginning. If this was just uh, a very uh, specific reality, but the answer is not. I mean, uh, we have checked, and this was more about Latinos and Latin America, so I didn't want to mix it with the United States. But I could send you hundreds of links of journalists from, you know, Spain, uh, the UK, US, Canada, Japan, that are doing exactly the same. You know, and that it's sometimes because it's bigger, you just don't see them, you know, because there, there are so many. But this is a much more um, common practice that we think. And, and when you introduce me and said, oh, the she is an influencer, oh, actually, this is not truth. I'm going to clarify this. I was doing more my, let's say, ethnographic, uh, always some uh, advices from Pablo <laughs> a few years ago, he will remember. And, and I thought, well, maybe I can really understand this from the inside. And you know, I'm a journalist as well, and I know some of these people, so why, why not? And then you realize that there is a huge world inside uh, that, and again, if they know the rules, they will, they will feel more comfortable in terms of uh, their internal autonomy or how to move. But this is not our achieving reality only at all. The, the, the person who asked that question said, interesting answer, thank you. Um, and I have a um, um, kind of like extension, I mean, a question that could be related to those journalists who decided to not have in any kind of relationship and, on social media. And they have uh, given multiple uh, reasons, for example, in terms of all the hate speech, all the criticism, cancel culture. So, um, why we're seeing like this polarism between people who can embrace social media journalists can embrace it and have this good relationship with audiences, but also we are seeing journalists who are having very terrible experiences. And because of that, they are closing those accounts or just to have a very minimal, right? Yeah, well, um, in, in the article we published with uh, Amaranta Alfaro in digital journalism a couple of, I think it was a month ago or so, uh, we ad addressed that point. And we call them a more uh, skeptical. There is a more skeptical, you know, perspective of some journalists. I mean, it's it's not mutually exclusive, but but some of them are, are very there, and uh, and it's it's just a twofold answer because on the one side they do not recognize these platforms as as you know professional itself. They 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 just say, well, I I'm not being paid to do this. This is a lot of work. <laughs> this is more work. I mean, I cannot do this. I'm, I'm very exposed. And or it's so turbulent, it's so negative, it's et cetera, et cetera. So I need to protect my credibility and they just embrace on that. They just, you know, they hold that. Like, so it, it's a much more, um, I would say naturalization at, at the same time uh, of, of traditional journalism. And that they, but it's a, it's a quite legitimate decision, right? And um, on the other side, they just are worried about the mix of the professional and the personal. I mean, they are doing that anyways. I mean, because people are following them because it's not because they are necessarily nice. I mean, because they are journalists, right? But they said, no, I, I will never make things. I mean, this is only for contacting sources or, you know, seeing what's going on, but I'm not going to, you know, just say, oh, this ice cream is amazing. It's so nice. Or a picture of my, of my partner or with my children, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes they, they do it unconsciously, right? But they, that's what they said, basically, yeah. Great, thanks for the question and the answer. <laughs> uh, Diego, can I, can I jump in with a couple of questions? Of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, for a superb presentation. I have lots of um, questions. Let me ask you a few and then you, you choose which one or ones you want to uh, respond to because there, there is a common matrix. What is fascinating to me, among other things about this research program, is how it challenges a number of boundaries at the same time and a number of taken for granted ideas uh, for people who have been studying journalism and have been studying digital media at the same time. 
So one has to do with the comparative aspect. I mean, you have a very, very strong and deep expertise in comparative research. You circumscribe the presentation of your findings to Chile, uh, yet you commented that this seems to apply, the phenomena seem to apply um, to other parts of the world. Um, so I wonder, first of all, whether you can comment on or whether you see some particularities uh, for Chile, for Latin America, for Latinos and Latinas, you know, in, in the US in terms of presentation, uh, relative to other parts of the world, because I, I, to a certain extent, cultures that are more gregarious and more collectivist um, might probably have a different predisposition to this blurring of the personal and the professional, the cultures that are more individualistic and instrumental. Right, so, so that's one. This, the second blurring that I see here of the boundaries has to do with sort of church and state, as it's called in journalism, so with the editorial and the commercial side of uh, the house, because um, one might imagine that some of uh, these uh, journalists slash influencers are getting additional compensation for what they are posting um, that they are not sharing with their employer. Right. Um, so, and I, I, I wonder uh, to what extent that signals a deeper turn in the relationship between news organizations and journalists. I was reminded in a very, very different context nationally and historically and technologically of the first book of Sally Hughes, where she studied the role of democratization uh, in you know, the role of journalism and the news media democratization in Mexico. And she showed that you know, for many, many decades, um, uh, newsrooms used to be okay, used to be tolerant with journalists receiving additional compensation from uh, state sources so that they wouldn't have to pay them that much, right? So it's a completely different case here, but we are seeing you know, the journalists being compensated in part for the work that they perform as uh, in a particular organization without the organization um, being compensated for that. The third um, uh, boundary that your work blurs uh, quite remarkably is between sort of the seriousness of the objectivity tenet and the humor that you see in the practices of the journalist. I mean, I, I, I was trying to picture what Walter Cronkite might post on Instagram if he was alive and active. And I, I mean, I, certainly not many of the posts that you share will be, uh, will be shown by him. So, you know, part of the canonical image that we have of journalism and the journalist has to do with the seriousness of objectivity that is blurred in these spaces because the vernacular in particular for Instagram is a much more informal and humorous tone. And the fourth uh, boundary that you alluded to, but I was wondering whether you could perhaps comment a little bit more is the cross-platform difference, right? There is now more and more call for research that moves us away from Twitterology, which is a lot of the research on social media um, has you know, focus on Twitter, um, secondarily on Facebook and taking one platform at a time, you have data from two platforms. And I was wondering, and you mentioned that there are some differences, to what you attribute those differences. Is it a technological issue, is the culture of the platform, um, or something else, or a combination of those? So, so those are you know, four different sort of manifestations of the blurring of the boundaries that, that is clearly a central part of your research. And I was wondering whether you, you could comment on one or more of them. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Uh, let me, let me see how I start now. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, very good question. Um, well, the cross, oh, let's start from, from the end. Uh, cross platform research. Well, yes, uh, uh, in two sides, offline and online, because, you know, there are differences between uh, journals that are coming from, you know, some offline platforms. So, but we have found at the very broad the beginning of, of the, the broad, uh, uh, raw data, let's say, is that journals from, uh, Curiously, journalists from online newspapers are less attached to social media, you know, uh, uh, accounts. At least they don't use it for uh, working purposes. Most of them have a private account. 
And it's very interesting because we took, and that, that part I'm not sure, I, I cannot say if that's you know, a global situation or not. But at least in Chile, we, we went to these almost southern profiles of national journalists working for national media, you know? So it's more of a sort of a consensus of that. Uh, and the difference between the online and the rest was brutal, you know? So all this projection of working with this uh, media branding or personal branding, et cetera, was even high on uh, journalists working for newspapers, print newspapers, and higher on television, right? For, for very obvious reasons. And also radio, because in Chile, several journalists that work in television also work in radio. So they have programs and they move to the two. But uh, in terms of what you say uh, about the cross-platform research internally, I mean, at the online level, yes, uh, there are clear differences. And that the, those differences are not random. I mean, they are clearly, clearly related to uh, the media logics that they have. And the paper that Alfred Omega and I uh, wrote for that, I think it's, it's not an advertising, but it's, it's really good on that, just clarifying those aspects. For example, you know, the rhetorical practice, the expected behaviors that you have on Instagram will never be the same on Twitter. So the same journalists that I, I show you that post some stuff on, in, on Instagram, they will never do that on Twitter, even if it's the same audience. You know, it doesn't need to be a different audience. It's just, they know that here the, the, the rules of the games are this ones and here the others. Here we are more aggressive. We will never tolerate this. Here is everything is nice, curated, and you know, it must be perfect. And if you can show me the perfection, it's, it's wonderful. There is another thing about aesthetics as well, you know, that, that brings you to, to, to play with this. And although the journalists haven't been, you know, in a, in a formal course on how to deal with this, they are learning a lot. I mean, some of these guys are like a book. You know, you take a book of human research, for example, and compare it to Jose Manuel de Tezanon, and it seems that he reads everything because he's doing exactly what he, he should do there. It's everything, it's perfect. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how they, some of them target social media platforms, others just decide to do everything, you know, in the same way, and others just decide to go for one and, and stay there or something. So it's, that's, uh, that's uh, something that definitely future uh, research and other people should go more in depth. Like why, you know, for example, these expected these behaviors are as different, the expected behaviors in some platform than in others, you know? What this is telling us about the audience or about the platform itself, because it could be a different answer, you know? Uh, on the other side, what, uh, and, I, and I, I think it's a very, very good question what you ask about the editorial and commercial side. Uh, I read the book of Sally, which is an amazing book. And I think that this is not that different. And that's the point. I mean, that the media is, is not only allowing them, the media is sometimes even encouraging them because they are saving the media in a way. So they are saving them. They are bringing people to the pool. They are bringing people, you know, to watch the news, to click on the website, et cetera, et cetera, because they have that sort of a, you know, social power there. So I think that the, the, the profession, our profession has a huge, you know, uh, opportunity, but at the same time, a huge responsibility to, to deal with this new sort of public sphere for, you know, in communication. Things have changed from one place to another. And, and I have the impression, that it's not my expertise, but that there are so many research on how the business of journalism, you know, is dealing with preparedness and et cetera, uh, but not too much on how, you know, the products or advertisement is, 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 is I don't know, jumping the media and creating a new reality here. A new reality that some media have understood. <laughs> or at least they, they say, well, this is what we can do for now. What, what I don't, I'm, I'm not sure is what is gonna happen next. 
because that that's this is growing and growing in, and, and i think and i don't think there is a a, a a go back i mean this is just moving forward so um and yeah i mean relation to the countries uh yeah i mean of course if we think on the middle east uh or some asian countries uh you, it must be a completely different story i I haven't I haven't analyzed those cases at all. Just Japan, because of uh, funny of it, because I, I like culture, but uh, it's not that different there. But some others must react in a different way. Like I don't know what happened with China. Well, they don't have this, but they have other others which are rich as well, and they could do the same. Or you know, other Thailand or I don't know Qatar. Uh, well, uh, Emirates. I mean, that could be super difficult. Uh, uh, without doing a proper empirical research. But talking about more a Western perspective, you know, some commonalities at the cultural level, I'm not talking about developing democracy or not, but just a common understanding on, you know, these type of things. I believe that this is increasingly being a global phenomenon more than, you know, uh, specific things and that the commonalities sometimes are bigger than the differences. But I cannot just, you know, uh, assure that because I haven't, I haven't done it empirically. Yeah, that would be my answer. Thank you so much. And uh, Diego, I believe there is one more question in the Q&A. Yes, uh, I will read it aloud. Um, it's from Amaranta Alfaro, and she is asking um, how Instagram is turning into a news platform. Any comments on this platform role in your research? Yeah, uh, well, it is. It is, it is becoming a, a news platform, uh, but in different ways. So first, uh, the time, you know that the time, because uh, the, the, the rules are not the same on Twitter, right? So. Uh, when you, you go to Instagram, you post something that is going to be there forever, at least in your profile. Now, so when journalists use that for, uh, for news, what they post is something exceptional, you know, something that really, really, you know, you know just uh, across the boundaries of normality. But what they are using a lot is all the uh, technological opportunities, uh, technical opportunities and affordances that that platform is giving journalists much more than Twitter. So they use stories, they use lives, and they are reporting with their Instagram account. Sometimes even the media use the account of the journalists. So they say, if you wanna see more, go up to our Instagram, which no one follows or just a few, or to the one from the journalist, so you can see both sides. Uh, so those, you know, part of Instagram that were uh, underdeveloped in the beginning now are, are you know, are being strong on, on that. Some of the journalists that we interview um, tell us that they, they felt very, very happy when they, 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 they see that people uh, were, uh, you know, watching their stories on the best headlines of the day. They were creating information for them or taking apart that they didn't include in their uh, reportage of the day. So they take a bit, they, they don't share it. It's just for them to do it in this new space. Uh, and some of them also say that it's, 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 it's a good way to, um, to reach sources, you know, and it's not that aggressive. Uh, but they realize also that uh, when something, when you want to publish something that is, is you know, uh, that's happening now, of course, Instagram is not the platform. Uh, uh, it's, it makes sense because, as I said, uh, there are affordances, not only technical, but all these different logics uh, make them different. And so they can be used for uh, different purposes or complement each other. Yeah. All right. But I just, I just want to add something. I'm sorry, forgot. And also, there is this. Uh, ten, there was, or there is, I don't know, this tendency of thinking that Instagram is only for soft topics. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, I had that impression too. But when you, as rules are always 
historical and contextual. So, for example, now with all what happened with the you know social movement in Chile, the demonstrations, the new constitution, coronavirus, etc., things changed a lot. I mean, you know, it was not uh, let's say politically correct in that social platform to post beautiful things, to post that you were having a wonderful you know, time because people were suffering like crazy. So they moved a bit, they re exactly as journalists and television move as, as well. I mean, you know, they just decide, okay, so we need to do something now. We need to just declare what we think and post about it, you know? So the whole, even I would say agenda of Instagram move to a more political agenda and the soft topics just disappear because it was not politically correct. It was not an expected behavior, you know, it was so irrespectful. I mean, they couldn't do that. So uh, it's, it's, it's a platform that can move from one topic to another, depending on the circumstance. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. That's a great way to wrap up a most insightful seminar. Thank you, Diego, for great moderation uh, and introductions today. Thank you, Claudia, for a spectacular, truly, truly insightful presentation. Thank you, our audience, for staying with us uh, through the end. And I want to invite everybody to join us again uh, next week when we have Hernando Rojas from the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, uh, deliver a presentation on social media. There is a question about the recording and it will be available uh, in about three days, between two and three days. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great rest of your weeks. <laughs>